Welcome to Shifting the Lens, uh, Perspective on Life in Our Community. And as most of you know, tonight's session is on addictions. So uh, we put together a panel for you, which will be a little more structured. Over here on my right, far right, is Peter Williams. Uh, he is a member of, of PARN, and uh, they focus on harm reduction. Part of our program, yeah. yeah. Uh, and to my close right here is uh, Sergeant Terry Cox. And uh, where do you work, Sergeant? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the Clark of the Lakes Police Services? There's me. My name is Desmond Meenan. I'm a psychiatric nurse at Ross Memorial Hospital. I've uh, been at this for 19 years. And uh, my focus is psychosis at the uh, hospital. My close left over here is a colleague of mine, Lisa Canesta. She also works at Ross Memorial Hospital. She's a case manager on the mental health inpatient and at community counseling. She's the co-chair of Concurrent Disorder Capacity Building Team, and it's a big interest of hers. Uh, and to my far left is uh, Jeanette Hecker, and uh, she works for a forecast. And uh, she'll give a little explanation of that when we get down there. Um, so we'll get down to the questions. The first question for, we'll start over here with Peter. Uh, because this field is so vast and there's so many models out there to help people battle addictions, I would ask you to define addictions for us and what is the role of your organization? Uh, how does it service people with addictions? Uh, well, as for definition of addiction, that's, I suppose I would have to go with um, anytime someone becomes dependent on a particular substance or something else that they then would sacrifice uh, mm. other aspects uh, of their well-being and life in order to sustain that one particular thing that they've become uh, dependent on, addicted to. Um, for PARN, um, our interest is uh, about HIV prevention work, and so um, all of our activities are based on trying to prevent and reduce the spread of HIV, hepatitis C, and other blood-borne infections, uh, and sexually transmitted infections. So. We use a harm reduction lens and a social determinants of health lens to do our work, which means that one of the activities we engage in is needle exchange programming, safer inhalation uh, programs. So we intersect with people who are living with addictions who need needle exchange who are accessing our services in that way. Um, and what we're able to do then through that intersection is to make referrals to other partners who are um, provide other services that deal with addictions, whether it's treatment, Thanks, Peter. Sergeant Cox? The interesting thing about this panel here today is we all have a different focus towards addiction. Um, mine obviously being a law enforcement focus. So I spent some time actually trying to come up with a definition of addiction that, that relates to, I don't want to say my area of expertise, but relates to my reason for being here. And I found two that, are, that I really liked that related towards, uh, towards law enforcement. The first one I found on dictionary.com, and it defined addiction as the state of being enslaved to a habit or a practice. With respect to law enforcement, I think that's very, very important to understand. The second one was uh, a Merriam-Webster definition, and it's called a, it, sorry, it's defined as a strong and harmful need to regularly have something, whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, whether it be gamble. Unfortunately, substance abuse is often associated to drug crime. My role as a police officer is to basically protect you as our community. That's how we get involved from a policing perspective. How we try and help, the pendulum with respect to law enforcement has changed drastically over the past 25 years that, that I've seen. Um, Initially, 25 years ago, we were enforcement, 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 and that was drilled into us. Uh, now it's not quite that way, although we feel that enforcement is certainly an important part of, of protecting our community, now we're getting into all the community partnerships that you're seeing here. You're seeing the interaction between everyone in this panel and others that aren't here in, in fighting addiction and trying to come with come up, sorry, with some resolution, a happy medium between enforcement and, uh, and, and treatment. Thank you. Lisa. Uh, so for, for my role in looking at um, addictions, really we're looking at it from the mental health perspective. So 
and I, Jeanette, you're probably going to look at the sort of continuum of, so you have anything from substance use to substance dependence. Um, when we look, when we're looking at it sort of from a diagnosis standpoint, we use what's called the DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual. Um, and that, so that looks at criteria um, of what uh, an addiction uh, formal diagnosis would be. So they look at things like tolerance, withdrawal, um, so tolerance meaning you need more um, to get the same effect, withdrawal if you're not using, you're experiencing some sort of withdrawal symptoms, um, a continued use despite harm, um, giving up of other uh, things in your life, uh, could be work, school, those kind of things. Um, a loss of control around use, so using uh, potentially more than you might intend to use of something. And, and I want to be cautious, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of speaking in terms of substance, but addictions can also include any kind of behavior um, that creates that uh, kind of response in the brain. Spending a lot of time uh, either thinking about it, uh, getting it, or recovering from it. Um, so when, when we're looking at it from the sort of diagnostic point, you'd be looking at all of those pieces. Um, yeah. Thank you, Lisa. So um, from a forecast perspective, we look at things on a very individual basis. Um, so we would say that a problem exists when continued use of a mood-altering substance or gambling behavior means more to the person than the problems that result from it. The Center of Addiction and Mental Health would look at the four C's. So how are they having cravings? Is there a loss of control over the amount and frequency of the use or the gambling behavior? Is there a compulsion to use or gamble? And do they continue to use despite consequences? So at Forecast, we do recognize that people have substance use or gambling behaviors on a continuum that could be from one end of no use all the way to dependency, and that at different points in time, um, people can shift uh, along the continuum with further supports and treatment. Um, yeah, that's our role. Thank you. So what are some of the most common addictions that you've seen out there? Um, for us, probably as far as um, substance use goes, because we only focus on substance use like alcohol, drugs, and gambling, we don't do other behavioral addictions, probably what we see would be alcohol, opiates, and when I say opiates, I mean drugs like Oxycontin, Dilaudid, Percocets, uh, morphine, fentanyl patches, that's what I mean when I say opiates, um, then we would probably see cocaine and cannabis. We also provide services for gambling, and considering we're close to three major gambling venues with Casino Rama, um, Port Perry with the Blue Heron, and uh, Cortha Downs, um, we are still not seeing a lot of gambling numbers, and that's part of the, the stigma to actually seek out treatment and support. But we do provide uh, gambling services as well. On the um, so I, I did a little uh, polling of, of some of my colleagues because we have, where I work, in the inpatient unit, um, often, I mean, when people are coming into the inpatient unit, they're in a pretty intense state of crisis. Um, so typically, in terms of addictions or substance use issues uh, that come in would be alcohol. Um, we also see a lot of uh, people with marijuana um, and potential psychosis resulting from that. Um, in eMERGE, uh, they can see anything from alcohol, marijuana, to a lot of the over-the-counter over -counter medications, gravel, cough medicine. Um, with, um, it, it, it was also pointed out to me in terms of um, eMERGE, there's also lots of people who are coming into eMERGE for physical reasons, falls, um, and some sort of accident where we may not be alerted um, or it may not be called attention to. So there's certainly probably other things coming in. But I think the primary that we are seeing is that those sort of three, um, certainly the opiates <coughs> at times as well. I think it would be no surprise for me to tell you that drugs and alcohol are, are our most significant abuse problem that we deal with on a regular basis. 
Uh, third to those two would be gambling. And uh, as I indicated before, uh, unfortunately with, with drug abuse being our number one and, and, and substance abuse associated to, to drug-related crime, that's what we tend to deal with, with the most from, from a policing perspective. Through community surveys that we've been conducting, say, over the past five years, you as a community have indicated to us that drug crime or substance abuse crime is one of your most important things you wish us to deal with. And when I say substance abuse crime, I'm dealing with sometimes violent crime and sometimes property-related crime. Um, but you yourselves have indicated to us that in your opinion, drug-related uh, abuse is, is the most significant. And I would have to say that the majority of our time is spent with regards to enforcing drug-related issues uh, again, secondly would be alcohol, and thirdly would be gambling. And with the gambling, we're seeing more, say, uh, white-collar frauds to cover some gambling debts and that sort of thing. So the gambling leads to, to fraudulent crime in order to pay for that particular uh, practice or, or... Anyway, uh, that would be it for me. Thank you. Fascinating. Pete? Um, yeah, I think to just... Uh, reiterate what other people have spoken to and, and Jeanette uh, in particular. Um, you know, we do a, an intake with each new client that we serve and we're constantly trying to get feedback from folks about what they're experiencing and seeing. And so alcohol is, continues to be number one, um, but opiates, uh, cocaine and um, cannabis behind that. Thank you. Peter, could you put a human face on addiction? Uh, by that, I mean, uh, who are we talking about? Gender, age, background, general demographics? What do you see in your work? Um, I mean, my most common response to that question in a group like this is to ask the audience to just look around the room. Um, I, I can't describe the face of addiction because it looks like everyone, brother, sister, neighbor. Um, uh, I, I see all types of people walk through our doors looking for assistance. Um, you know, I think that, that one of the things I was speaking to earlier is that um, when you're talking about addictions, really you need to look at what the drivers are for that. Like, why do people become addicted? And often addictions, um, I often describe them as a survival technique. People are trying to overcome something, get away from something, deal with something, and then their method for doing that overtakes them, and that's the addiction. So it can happen to anyone. I can't answer that question any better. Uh, we keep statistics for everything. And uh, if I were to try and find uh, a common denominator throughout those on, on which face could be having substance abuse issues over another, it's absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. from, from your homeless person on the street to your most well-to-do person in our community, someone in their family could be just as prone to, to substance abuse issues as, as that homeless person on the street. So to put a face to it, no, no, I, I can't either. And even though we keep all these statistics, you're, you're going to find it right off the charts as to, as to age, gender, um, difficult. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we all probably sort of are going to give a similar response that, um, you know, we see a cross section of people and uh, from all socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. And I, th I think sometimes what changes a little bit is maybe the substance. You might see patterns and, and themes and in terms of young people and older people and, and what people are using. But um, yeah, in, in terms of I think anybody is. Uh, certainly at risk and um, I, I can't remember I think it was Peter that you you said that um, you know it, it is I, I think from the mental health standpoint I also think from this the addiction standpoint it's seen um, it's often a coping right we're coping with something we're trying to deal with something um, so in some ways it's uh, either a symptom or a coping strategy to deal with the symptoms so. <coughs> Nothing to add. Same Good thing. job. Okay. Good job, guys. <laughs> so, Jeanette, how do you measure success, and uh, what is your success rate? Okay. And what are the, some of the challenges that people in the service face in getting that success? 
Well, to be honest, our success is their success. So any changes that produce any positive outcome, even in the tiniest increment, um, is a successful step. Um, for, at Forecast, we take a harm reduction approach. We are an abstinent-based. So the success could be learning ways to use substances in a safer way. It could be providing clean needles and ejection equipment to reduce uh, infectious disease. It could be learning signs of possible overdose, um, managing cravings and reducing stress. It could be the goals of focusing on the reduction of substance use and reduction of gambling. So um, each, each small change is a success for us. I, I was just sit, sort of sitting here thinking, and, and that I, I agree with Jeanette. I think from a clinical standpoint, um, it's very much directed by the individual, what they're looking for, what their goals are. Um, Clearly, we're looking for some level of stability in whatever parts of their life are being affected. Um, so that's sort of the, the clinical perspective. From a systems perspective, I think the system is looking probably at reducing rehospitalization, reducing visits to the emergency department, that kind of thing. Just coming from the hospital, um, I need to think it with that lens as well. So. Um, but, you know, working with individuals one-to-one, -one, yeah, you are looking at um, trying to be where they are and go from there in terms of developing goals and plans for more stability. Um, I've, been I've been a police officer for, for 24 years and, and have been involved in drug enforcement for the most part of that 24 years. And as I indicated before, uh, trends with respect to law enforcement have, have changed dramatically 24, since 24 years ago. Then, it, well, you, were, you were held accountable for the number of charges you laid with respect to drug enforcement, and that's how success was measured then. Not just arrests and, and how you dealt with an individual, but 24 years ago, you measured success by number of drug or alcohol-related charges. As I indicated earlier, the pendulum is now shifting. It's not so much your charges, it's, it still could be your arrest, but it's now it's how you deal with them. For example, the, the challenges faced by, by many of the people that we deal with is that the compulsion that they have for, for the substance, whether it be drugs or whether it be alcohol, makes them fairly much so an everyday criminal. That desire, that withdrawal need that they have to have that particular drug or alcohol or, or whatever puts them in the criminal limelight right off the bat whether they want to or not so that's the challenge that they have is just having that addiction alone puts them into the realm of of being a possible criminal from a law enforcement perspective and how we deal with that now is instead of forcing people through the criminal court system, forcing them to, well, forcing them into abstinence. That's how we used to deal with it 24 years ago. If you were arrested and charged with a drug-related offense, you were placed on certain terms not to have or possess that particular substance. Simple as that. And you were dealt with accordingly through the courts. Now it's not so much um, an abstinence term, although you do still do see it, but just putting that term on them is basically an invitation to them to break the law again. It's either break the law or go through that physical withdrawal. Those are some of the challenges that the people we deal with in our community are, are facing every day. And how we measure success is changing every day. How I measure it tomorrow is going to be different how I measure it today in comparison with 25 years ago. So I'm hoping the pendulum is changing and, and we're seeing the light and getting a lot better with respect to treatment as opposed to having your thumb on the pulse of, of, of an addiction. Um, so I guess for us, it would be a combination of answers because you know, again, that, that harm reduction lens that we use is um, looking at benefits for, well, recognizes that you can't separate individual health from community health. So you need to take care of both. So for us, we measure success by when we see any success 
in a client because harm reduction is a client-centered model. It's meeting people where they're at and working with them as they're willing and able. And then through that, we hope that we're also having a positive impact, um, as Lisa put it, on the systems perspective, you know, that we're reducing the number of visits to the emergency room, for example. Um, what we've learned is that uh, through needle exchange programs, oftentimes that's many clients' first interaction with the social support system. So they've been marginalized by their substance use, they don't feel like they can access services, they maybe don't have a, a family doctor anymore, and so by coming in for clean uh, needles, um, we're able to then have conversations with them about, well, what other services are you able to access? Um, can I connect you up with treatment services? Can I connect you up with something else? And so we work with all of our partners to do that. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, I think really just um, all of our partners are under-resourced. I think that without access to um, safe and adequate housing um, and without access to food, two of the most critical, shelter and food are two of the most critical. So without um, easy access to those in our communities, that undermines any efforts against addictions. Um, and I would certainly say that uh, one of the issues that we deal with is a lack of a um, residential treatment facility. <clears throat> Peter, are addictions or the situations of people with addictions here in the city of Quarth Lakes any different from an urban area like Toronto? I don't know if anyone in the panel has worked in Toronto or has been, have you worked in other places? So yeah, I, I have, well not in addictions necessarily, yeah. but it, again, it's all, there's the intersectionality, so I have a little bit of experience in Toronto. Um, certainly I would say that again, when you look at some of the drivers of, of at least substance use, which may or may not lead to addictions, um, we often talk about that uh, social isolation and isolation is one of the contributing factors. So in our rural area, that's something that wouldn't be experienced in a larger urban center. Um, access to employment. Um, so there's more employment opportunities in a larger center than we face in some of our rural communities. Um, and then just as I was talking about in terms of like a residential treatment center, some of those other services that might support people um, as they try to deal with it. So I would say that the folks in our community and in rural settings face greater challenges um, for all of those reasons and again, under-resourced. What do you see in Sergio Cox? I have a difficult time answering that question because I find it almost impossible to compare an apple to an orange. We're a very unique community with respect to our, our isolation. Our, our, we do have you know, a, a somewhat urban area, but we're, we're unique and we're, we're, we're very unique. And for us to, to compare us to, to Toronto, I find it very difficult. As I indicated before, we keep statistics for everything. Our crime statistics relating to, as I indicated earlier, drug activity, are actually down since 2006 and they have been steady, steadily declining and when I say drug activity I'm referring to violent crime and I'm referring to property related crime so those particular statistics are decreasing I am not aware of other another uh, community of the same demographics as, as us to compare that to. If I had to guess, I would say we're in a much better situation here than an equivalent uh, community from a law enforcement perspective. Thank you. Lisa? Um, yeah, I, I would just, I guess, reinforce again um, the, I think we cover a large expanse of area um, and you know, yes, we have this sort of one sort of city area within the city of Kortha Lakes um, where the majority of the services lie. Um, and then we have all this other rural area, which, uh, I mean, I think the barrier of getting to services is certainly one that's shared with me on a regular basis that, you know, I, oh, I can't do that because I can't get there. And I, um, so that's a big challenge, I, I think. Um, that the city isn't necessarily dealing with. Uh, any city centre, you know, they've got busing and they're, they're doing that. I mean, I, I think the city of Quarth Lakes is, is attempting to address that in certain ways by having some outlying buses and, and things like that. But certainly, um, 
that is a big difference. And just the whole under-resourced um, uh, specialized services um, that they have. You know, if you go into the city, um, it just thinking from the standpoint of mental health and, and substance use, you know, if you go to a center like Center for Addiction and Mental Health, you know, they have a multitude of groups and specialized things um, that we just don't have the resources for here. Um, so we're often sort of doing things and stretching ourselves a little bit further and uh, uh, to, to meet certain needs. And so I certainly think, um, yeah, a big difference would be fewer resources, um, detox, um, certainly was one when I talked to my colleagues who work in the, the uh, eMERGE department. Um, detox beds, they, you know, that was a, a very clear piece for them that they feel that we need that here and um, treatment that's closer to home um, and more residential treatment. Sorry, we have your treatment. <laughs> so, yeah, more resources. So, I'm basically the same idea, you know, the rural setting, huge geographic area to cover. Um, we do have offices, so Forecast has offices in Minden, Lindsay, Peterborough, Camberford, and Coburg. But that's still a huge geographic area to cover, and people who are living outside of those city centers do have difficulty getting in for supports. Um, so transportation and the transit system is certainly a barrier. Uh, closest withdrawal management center or detox, if you want to call it that, is Pinewood, which is in Oshawa. So obviously people have to get there. Next closest is Barry or Kingston. So transit is a huge <coughs> barrier for some people. You talked a bit about the constraints and the barriers. That's the next question. Was there anything that we missed as far as doing your work? And what's the wait list at, at Forecast? So at Forecast, we don't really have a wait list. Um, and part of that is we try to complete an intake within 24 business hours. Um, people can access a group every week. Um, we have a partnership with Pinewood, um, and they provide a 24-hour support line, so 24 hours, seven days a week. So people could access supports at any time. Um, and then from there, you would go to individual group therapy. Um, there, Wait lists are part of being referred to a residential withdrawal management center or a residential treatment center, but that, those centers are actually outside of forecast. But people could get supports immediately. Um, it just may not be individual, it may not be in person all the time. On the inpatient? <laughs> <laughs> no wait lists on the inpatient unit. Um, people can access, uh, typically we have crisis nurses in eMERGE. Uh, we don't have them 24-7, that's for sure. Um, it changes a little bit. To, I think we have them until 10 o'clock during the week, so from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. Crisis, so uh, people can be seen and emerge uh, if they're in crisis. Um, most of our services don't have a lengthy wait time other than potentially um, our day program, which is our group's... Um, there is a wait time for that, and I believe you could be looking at January, March. However, we have a couple of dropping groups that people can go to um, during that time period. Uh, and then most of our other services, brief services, I believe the wait time probably would be three to four weeks, um, potentially to see somebody um, for some brief counseling or crisis support. Um, crisis support meaning not emerge crisis support, but just needing to see somebody sooner than later kind of thing. Any constraints or barriers that would go on in the inpatient? For, I mean, from my standpoint, part of what my role on the inpatient unit is discharge planning. <laughs> so, yes, from my, from my standpoint, there are barriers because there's a lack of resources. And um, uh, certainly from for substance uh, issues, a lot of people come into our center and into our hospital and they're wanting to go to treatment. Um, now Jeanette and, and the forecast team, um, there is a continuum, right? And person's readiness to go into a residential treatment center. So um, I'm, I'm learning more about that and, and taking that into consideration. But um, certainly for those people who are really motivated and ready for that step, 
boy, wouldn't it be great if that could happen from there. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly a barrier. Can I add, sorry, sure, just, can I? Um, some other kind of barriers, barriers would be just the stigma, the fear of accessing Absolutely. services, the shame that can go with identifying that you have a substance use problem. That can stop people from accessing services. Um, resources and funding is obviously next. But, and then also working with other agencies with a different mandate. So yeah. they see things very different, differently. So those can be other barriers. I've been waiting for that specific answer and I haven't heard it yet, so I'm gonna actually bring it up. Would love to have more funding to do more for our community. Certainly that is, is a barrier that we all face, everyone on this panel, not just from an enforcement perspective. But I, I think one of our, our biggest constraints up until now was our, well, I shouldn't say now, but our, our traditional role of policing was we did it all ourselves. We didn't meet with any community safety groups. We didn't meet with and collaborate with other panel representatives. 20 years ago, that was our responsibility and our responsibility alone. Now, as I indicated, that pendulum is, is swinging. We're all collaboratively working together to solve these issues. And that has been our biggest barrier so far. Once we got past that, once we realized that we need your help, things have changed. And I, it's my opinion that things are only gonna get better because as we develop more of these community safety groups, things are going to improve drastically. No longer do I have to have this massive budget to do it myself, but if we all work together, we can get it done. Not just with my budget, but with everyone else's budget here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, certainly in terms of just jumping off where, where you were speaking to, Terry, that um, Parn has been an active member, one of the founding members of the Four County Harm Reduction Coalition that works throughout the um, HKPR health unit region. So that includes uh, the Kawartha Lakes region. Um, so the, the partnerships that come through that have been fantastic. Um, in Peterborough County, that has evolved into an actual drug strategy, which uses a four pillars model of collaboration to address the issues and impacts of uh, substance use on communities. So that's enforcement, prevention, harm reduction, and treatment. So um, all at this table. Um, and it's those collaborations have made a huge difference to the impact that we're able to have. Um, and then I think you were asking about wait lists and mm -hmm. that. So there's no uh, referral process for becoming a client at PARN. So our, the Needle Exchange Program, the Harm Reduction Works Program is functional during our regular office hours, which is Monday to Friday, nine to five, through our offices in Peterborough. And we have a satellite site right here in Lindsay that operates at the OATC office um, on Fridays <laughs> from one till three. So that's the end of the questions for all the panelists. So the questions now are going to be directed at any panelist that wishes to answer them. Um, we'll start with, and I did email them beforehand, does anybody have any statistics that we haven't discussed regarding the population that you service? We're talking men, women, youth, adults, seniors, <laughs> singles, married people. And I'm not talking about the, the, what we were seeing before as a face of an addiction, but what is what are the demographics that you, need, that you usually see? Okay. Of the ages with substance use problems, it's typically between age 15 to 24 that are struggling the most with substance abuse issues. Um, I think another, it's a little bit not so much a demographic, but I think it's an important enough statistic to note is that more than half of the people struggling with substance abuse issues have had a mental health issue at some point in their lifetime, especially when we're talking about depression and anxiety. And for a long time, concurrent disorders or mental health issues has not been recognized as a significant indicator of potential substance use and addiction issues. And that's an important note. Thank you, Jim. Anybody else have any statistics? Um, as I indicated earlier, we're all over the map with, with our demographics, but it's interesting to note that uh, alcohol abuse tends to, uh, to be somewhat older in age. And I would agree that we're dealing with the 16 to 25 mark with respect to drug abuse. 
So alcohol abuse is, is significantly um, later in life in comparison with, uh, with drug abuse. I don't have any hard numbers, but just in terms of the demographic, we see all age groups. I wouldn't be able to say that the, the group, the people that we're seeing are necessarily in that younger population. And, and that it's, it's all over the map in terms of, I think often people think of addictions as being illicit drug use, uh, drugs that they're obtaining illegally. And we see many clients who are prescribed their medications and through not following the proper what their doctors have told them on how to use them or through other issues, they're, they're combining drug use, drug, drugs, um, you know, mm -hmm. situations arise where suddenly they find themselves dealing with an addiction. So. And I just want to add in terms of statistics, um, again, um, with the hospital, it's always kind of challenging with statistics because, for example, pre presentations in Emerge, um, the substance use isn't necessarily going to be presented as the primary. It doesn't mean that it's not contributing. Um, uh, it may not be mentioned if it's not um, if it's not brought to the crisis person's attention. Certain questions may not be asked. So we're certainly trying to get better in terms of screening um, for substance. Whereas I think the flip side is is the uh, addictions um, f focus is trying to get better at screening in terms of mental health. We're trying to recognize that the two the prevalence rates um, are quite high for both. Um, interesting, I, I, I was looking at some of our inpatient statistics um, and there was a, a very large discrepancy in terms of uh, percentages over a period of time. So just to throw out numbers, July uh, to September 2012, we had a 98% with substance related disorders on our unit. So 98% of our patients were dealing with some sort of substance related. Um, January to March of this year was 50%. So it can certainly shift and change, and, and uh, but I would say probably on average, it's somewhere in between those two. Um, it's, it's quite high. Um, so prevalence between mental health and addictions or substance use is high. CAMH has some really good stats and information um, if people are interested more in that. Thanks, Lisa. What are some misconceptions about addictions that you encounter in your work? I'm sure the harm reduction people have had people debating with you, so mm -hmm. well, that's something I'll touch on here. I think, sorry if I can, sure, Jeanette no brought up stigma. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that. Um, you know that it's some sort of weakness that there's it's you can sort of uh, pigeonhole it with certain types of people and demographics and that kind of thing I mean I think there's um, a lot of misconceptions that unfortunately can interfere with people getting help mm -hmm. and that's the biggie I think some of the misconceptions that everybody who's involved with substance use or gambling behaviors is a criminal has a violent history yeah is homeless or in the low socioeconomic um, category or um, lacks morals in some way. But any kind of deviant behavior kind of gets put into that, uh, that slot. Yeah, certainly the, the, I was actually gonna try and come back to that, your point about stigma and shame, so I'm glad it came up again. Um, it, it's, it's probably one of the biggest challenges because it silences people. And so that stigma and shame prevents us from having conversations that might actually be helpful conversations and maybe actually head off um, situations before they lead to addictions. Um, so part of our job in that harm reduction model is trying to give people um, a context and a vocabulary to have conversations about substance use and recognize that there's a continuum and help uh, empower people to um, have conversations that, that they can learn more about themselves and learn more about the issues that they might be dealing with that might lead to addiction. Any hands up? No, just that it was already mentioned earlier that uh, a very huge misconception is, is that all drug abuse is illicit drugs. And, and as you indicated, it's certainly not. Um, through through uh, many community partners earlier this year in May, we, uh, 
we were able to hold a prescription drug drop-off event at, uh, at the Armouries Park. And it was very, very clear at that point in time that, that our community is full of prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly uh, one of the latest trends, uh, fentanyl abuse, is, is rapidly growing. And, and I'll hopefully get a chance to touch on that a little bit later on. But uh, um, so certainly drug abuse is, is not always illicit drugs. If I could just add, I think that, that what that makes me think of is that, again, that stigma and shame is about othering addiction. So it has to be somebody else. And so people don't take the right precautions when they've got prescription medications. They don't think that they need to really make sure that they're storing them safely so that other folks don't have access to them because they're thinking, oh, nobody in my house could be dealing with addictions. It couldn't happen here. Um, and that's not always the case. So people need to be vigilant. <coughs> Thank you. Sergeant Cox touched on this, uh, that addiction rates, are, do you feel that they're increasing or, or decreasing? And what do you speculate the reason is being in your fields? Well, from my perspective, that's pretty hard to measure, um, whether it's increasing or decreasing. You know, lots of studies have, have certain stats, but there's probably a large amount of people who aren't in those stats because they're not seeking help because of that stigma. Um, I know that it was identified that in 2006 the rates were decreasing, so is it because they're not seeking support? Is it because we're also diverting into court diversion programs so they're not being as identified as being charged or convicted of those drug um, or substance using uh, crimes? So it's, it's hard to know. I'd just like to clarify that in, in 2006 we've been able to identify that um, drug-related crime, such as violent crime or property-related crime, has been decreasing. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't say whether, because in my field, I can't say whether addictions are increasing or decreasing. I can only say that that, that factor associated to addictions has been decreasing. Hopefully, mm -hmm. which means that our addictions are decreasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a hard to measure because I can tell you that we have more people accessing our service. We have more people coming in uh, looking for referral to services, looking for access to food, looking for access to housing. So whether we're just seeing more people who are already part of the landscape or whether they represent new addictions, I can't measure that. Uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm pulling out. I, I decided to go on to Statistics Canada <laughs> just to see what they were finding out. And it's interesting because um, some of their statistics are suggesting that um, there's a decrease. Um, but I think from an agency perspective, though, we're now asking the right questions. So we are becoming more aware. And by becoming more aware, we can then provide the support, the treatment, um, whatever the person's looking at. So I think, you know, when I look at it from my perspective, it we seem to be having an increase, but I think let's hope that what that means is that people can come to the door and start talking about it, like you said. So, um, but I, I found the Statistics Canada stuff was interesting, but again, not quite sure who they're surveying. <laughs> so what changes in both our community and province or countrywide would have the biggest impact for your ability to do your work? So some some significant changes have already started by acknowledging uh, concurrent disorders. So um, with this change, there's an expectation that agencies start working collaborati collaboratively with uh, people supporting mental health and addictions. Um, some of that is the funding has been consolidated rather than uh, redundant services working kind of in silos. We're all starting to work together. So some of those significant changes have started, I would say. The collaborative teamwork, for example, amongst this panel and others with respect to our community <coughs> safety partners is going to be our biggest influence in, in the years to come. I would, I would voice the same. I think it's the collaboration is the big change. And, um, and it's an expectation now, which I think is great. It's uh, that, uh, that we do collaborate and we work together and that we screen and that we ask and mm -hmm. um, that it is, uh, from the, the mental health standpoint, we often say that it's, 
it's an expectation. So meaning we need to ask because we know that the prevalence with people with mental health issues, um, there is a high level prevalence of substance use. So it's important for us to ask the question. How do we, the community people around us, as, as here, uh, how do we help support those people dealing with addictions? And uh, how can we support you and your organization? Well, reducing stigma, so talk about it. Um, be aware of your own thoughts, your own judgments. Um, encourage people to seek out supports. Seek out supports for yourself. If you're a family member or a significant other, you can get supports as well. Um, watch your language about how you're talking about substance use and mental health issues. Yeah. I mean, certainly this panel is a great you know, example of the kinds of things that can be happening at the community level in terms of normalizing our conversations about addictions and the issues that drive people to use substances to begin with. Um, I guess I can't help but add um, in that having conversations that I think there's something that happens politically that um, can sometimes be fear-mongering around those people, again, because it's the othering, those people who use drugs and the negative impact they have on our communities. So how can we have different conversations that don't other people, that aren't about fear-mongering, but they're part of our community, so how do we bring them in and make them matter to the health of the community and make change happen that way? Thank you, everybody, for coming. I thought it was pretty good.